Hello, welcome to another video. In this video, we talk about the Timberlandian period of the Nicarthan Empire. In this period of time, you see that the Nicarthan Empire stops its civil wars and goes into essentially a short golden age. So, let's begin. The fuck? Sorry about that. The civil wars throughout the 600s, the Nicarthan Empire was always in some sort of a nearly state of constant war or civil war. This caused hundreds of millions to die and for the population to be reduced greatly. By the early 700s, people had enough, and in the year 711 of the Second Era, they crowned Elogoblin as the emperor of the Nicarthan Empire. Elogoblin made significant reforms. When he took the throne, he did these reforms because he realized that many problems of the Nicarthan Empire were due to one major thing. The heavy power of the emperor in, an, in a gigantic empire where the emperor couldn't be at all locations at a time. So, he split the empire into five main regions. Four provinces and one home province, the capital. These four provinces would have large sways of independence, such as being able to set up their own taxes, set up their own, you know, laws. They would also be able to fund their own guards, like police. But they still had to use, and they were also able to use their own armies, but the Nicarthan Emperor always had the Nicarthan army stationed across his empire. <laughs> <clears throat> and the taxes that um, the local provinces would collect would most likely go to the empire. So there were definitely several types of taxes. Um, one of them had to go to the emperor, and then probably the others would go to local administrators. Not exactly sure how I th think I'm going to do it, but that's the general idea for the moment. So... According to this as well, the army was still loyal to the emperor, and though it was heavily weakened, it was able to regrow into a somewhat powerful state, thus allowing for the provinces to unite. And this is a map of the Nicarthan Empire's provinces, Marthia, Goldland, the Timberlands, and then the Amshavite Empire. Not, I mean, not the Amshavite Empire, Algamore and Rockland. The Amshavite Empire is a completely different thing that is in this region, but it's far into the future. Other reforms of Elogoblin's reign include a constitution, in fact one of the first in the world, which prevented heavy taxation on the peasantry and the elite. This was to ensure the loyalty of his people and to prevent rebellions due to high taxation. A spending camp for the monarchy and aristocracy unless it was a, in a time of war. So essentially, you couldn't spend a lot of money unless you were in a state of war with someone else. You see, when we think of war, um, the traditional sense of war between nations wasn't really traditional. Instead, it was oftentimes between different people, or a person versus a tribe of people. So instead of your declaring war on a nation, you're declaring war on either a group of people or just a person. So that's what that means. There was also a reduction in corruption by stamping out corrupt officials, though this did not actually last that long as corruption continued to soar into the air. And then finally, probably the most important thing, they ended the genocide in Al Gamor and, and denounced the whole idea of killing Al Gamorans just for the sake of settling that region by Narthans. Now, the Al Gamorans were not treated fairly, but they were also given significant amounts of autonomy, and the emperors would often... Um, invest some of their money into Al Gamora to rebuild it, and also the local provincial governor. Stabilization. With the empire now being managed by much more capable people due to the reforms, the Nicarthan Empire entered into a golden age. Over time, local officials spent their money wisely, building up cities, roads, and improving the lives of their 
local regions. Things were not perfect, however, as corruption was still very high despite the attempted removings, and um and some areas would still be heavily taxed despite the constitution. However, on a wide general scale, things were largely improved from before then. And then we get to Goldland. Let me check it out. Oh, wait. Um, this is what I was supposed to be. I thought I clicked upwards. Anyway, so here were some significant changes in the empire. For one, trade increased beyond across the empire due to the long, to due to the prolonged uh, peace, which meant that now the economy would rise due to people exchanging more goods in cities such as Narthur, Marthia, etc., etc. People began to buy more luxury goods, often warm silks or bright gems or gold or whatever they could get their hands on. The trade of luxury goods was particularly uh, important for the Nakarthan Empire, as luxury goods were very, very um, sought after in the empire. The wealth of everyone, including the elite and the peasantry, increased by a significant amount. This led to them buying more products. This led to them being able to buy f things with food or buy food. And, well, this was a largely a good thing. This infrastructure was also significantly improved, with new worlds being built. And, well, it was a good thing. And then finally, the most important of these all, there was peace in the empire on a large scale. There was always small conflicts here and there, but these were limited to smaller things that would not go into a national-wide civil war. And so, large peace in the empire had it be, had, hasn't been seen for hundreds of years in the empire. Finally, long-term stability. With these reforms, living standards improved drastically. The emperors, though having their power weakened, were ruling over a much more powerful empire, with a large number of soldiers working for it. Due to the increased uh, conditions for the soldiers, the army grew in size, and it also helped expand the empire. This also saw the Nakarthans under a period of peace, which yada yada yada, I've already said, you know, that. Eventually, Nartha which was the third largest city in Avi, became the first, followed by South Gold, and then finally a new city called Amshika. Now, Amshika would later... It was one of the most populated cities. It was a... It's a historic city that belonged to an, a civilization known as the Amshavik civilization. And you see cities like that being rebuilt as before, only cities like Nartha were being rebuilt because that was really the main focus. But now these other cities are being built up from the ground, other than just Nartha and Marthia in the north. <laughs> now, one major problem at the time was that the weather was very was becoming more consistently cold, which led to famines. However, due to the good age of the empire that it was in as of the moment, there were large stockpiles of food which were oftentimes given to the peasants and like starving people to ensure that they would stay loyal. I think they call this in real life breads and circuses where you give them food and entertainment, but in this case it was just food. And entertainment was given in different ways, you get the point, feed your population so that they don't revolt. And now we finally get to some of the bad parts of the empire. By the 780s, a war known as the Golcathan War began, where the king of a newly founded kingdom called Goldland, whose name was Golcathan, launched an invasion of the Nakarthan Empire's positions in Goldland in the year, which nearly kicked out all Nakarthan forces from Goldland. So you can see here that this is a map of Goldland and the surrounding regions. Up this gray, this dark gray over here is the Nakarthan Empire. This yellow gold is the Golden Empire. This dark gold is what the gold kingdom of Goldland would have to cede to the Nakarthans in order to retain their land. 
you know, to retain their lands. And these, this gray is kind of like the last uh, several strongholds before the peace was made. You can also notice that in the south here, there are kingdoms being formed in the south in the land known as Shurek. Or Shurek. Um, Shurek? Crap, I can't say it right. Anyways. And then finally, the beginning of the true end. After the Treaty of Ganzax, the Kingdom of Goldland launched an attack into the Nakarthan Empire in the year 801 of the Second Era. This led to the end of Nakarthan control over Goldland, which caused a major crisis in the Nakarthan Empire due to the lack of gold. With a large mate, with a large amount of gold suddenly disappearing, the Nakarthans were resorted to using silver, which was a much more common metal in the north. In 807, inflation began to take place, as silver became the dominant currency, and large amounts of silver was being used, bringing down the value of silver quickly. This also led to the monarchy and even local administrators to have a hard time funding even the most basic things, leading to the silver crisis. So essentially what's going on is that these guys... Gold is super hard to find, and so instead of relying on gold, which is what they had been doing in the past, they decide to ultra mine silver and then use it as much as possible. Precious gems would rarely be used at this point as silver was so much easier to get, and this creates a chain of reaction where the inflation continues to soar up, the value of silver goes down, and well, people. <sighs> And well, it starts to get hard for the monarchy to fund anything. Now, to coincide with this, the famine that had been going on for years because of the cold conditions began to take place. Due to the inflation and the decline, you begin to see that, well, the starvation begins to take place as the emperors are no longer able to feed their populations. This leads to well over millions, if not tens of millions of people who aren't able to feed themselves. Tens of millions of people starve to death, which leads to a great crisis. This leads to a disease epidemic, which kills way more people. And so, you're kind of seeing, this isn't a civil war period, but this is more of like a plague slash famine period. <laughs> oh, also, fun fact, a named ho named Holska invented a drill-like device which was made which made it much easier to mine out metals such as iron. Essentially, it could drill into the ground. It required several men, but it was easy to drill into the ground and you could mine a lot more metal with this quicker and easier. So this also helped with the inflation because the mining technology had improved. <sighs> And so we get to Donica the Second. In the year 820, a woman named Donica inherited a throne after the previous emperor, Hegelson the Tenth, was assassinated by the Anvin Guard. In response, she disbanded the Anvin Guard, which caused the first and second Anvin Wars, which were fought in fought in Nartha. After several provinces, being Algamorn, Rockland, and Marthia, sent their armies to support, not to put down, but to support the rebels, she would eventually be forced in the year 841 to concede control and replace the Anvin Guard, who had at this point been disbanded. She was very well known for her religiousness and attempted to bring re religious reforms, such as allowing people of all religions to participate in the government and creating a festival where people of different religions would meet and discuss to have their, to discuss about their religion. However, she would be overthrown before many of these reforms could take place, and this was also a time in which a empress, emperor slash empress like this, simply couldn't do, as the empire had been facing much more dire situations, chaos. Due to these, uh, situ due to the situation going on, a period of time would begin in Marthia, which would be known as the Grey Wars. This was not one war, but a series, a collection of many, many wars. As foreign tribes, noticing the weakening presence of the Empire, launched numerous invasions from all sides. This lasted from 821 of the Third 
I mean, second era, all the way to 904 of the second era. Along with this, in the year 843, the Republic of Algamora declared its independence and war, and the War of Algamora independence would begin, which would eventually fail, but not without millions dead. And so now we got, well, not one, not two, but three major areas that are attempting to secede and break away from the Empire. Goldland, they've already been kicked out, but numerous raids still go into their neighboring territories. Marthia is being slowly pushed back, and Algamor eventually fails, but but the wars continue. Now, another thing to note is that, well, the Algamor genocide um, returns, and this actually causes the Algamorans to once again go under massive rebellion. But that's for a future, for the future. Now, what was the reason for this sudden decline? So, for one, gold and silver had inflated quite a bit. Another reason was the decline of the army, which had been being paid less when inflation was increasing. So, that was like a double ripoff. It was also very disloyal at this point, as many local leaders disloyal to the emperor could just say that the emperor wanted this to happen and the army didn't question it and sometimes the army even downright went against the emperor often times sometimes especially in the mid eight especially in the early to mid 800s they would claim that the emperor did not have a right to be an emperor and then there was also the overtime big issue of an inefficient ruling class that was more concerned for personal stuff rather than government government stuff. One of the more important ones was barbarian invasions, of course, from not just the west but from the south and the southeast as well. Massive plague epidemics occurring, such as in 776, when a massive plague epidemic hit the city in Noitha and killed well over 6 million people inside the city. In 792, the city of Southgold would be hit by a massive plague, and soon enough, the entire southwest region of Awi was hit by devastating diseases that killed tens of millions. And then in 831, when once again, Awi would be hit. Specifically, Nartha would be hit by another deadly disease, which would kill, not millions, but would nearly kill off the population of uh, of Nartha within a period of several years. Failure. The failure of Danica to create and replace the Anvend God meant that the nobility was displeased, displeased with the monarchy. This significantly weakened the power of the monarchy, as... Now they didn't have any support. It would be up to the task of the usurper of Danica, Krathen I, to build up the Nakarthid Empire. However, as I'll talk about in the next video, he chose a different option and used his position to further his own power, leading to a soon enough irreversible decline of the empire. I appreciate you watching. I know the first parts weren't that long of this video. That's because, well, as you get it, the Nakarthan Empire from around 700, and 700 to 770 was seen as kind of like the Golden Age. Specifically 711 to like 770 something, maybe 780 something. <laughs> After that, it begins to go downhill from there. And then it really spikes up in the 800s. Anyways, I hope you appreciated this video. Make sure to like, subscribe if you'd like. I really appreciate comments and I really like it when people um, are active in my community posts. Such as voting and just like voting in polls and quizzes and just, you know. Looking at what I post on there, because I do post stuff on my community posts. Anyways, that is it. I hope each and every one of you has a good day or night, and I will see you all another time.